Welcome, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the Coastal Studies Institute. My name is John McCord. I'm the Assistant Director of Engagement and Outreach here at CSI. And I want to welcome you here to the Coastal Studies Institute on the ECU Outer Banks campus. Just a few things before we get started with tonight's presentation. I have uh, a couple upcoming events that might interest you. Our big one is next Saturday, um, February 29th. Our annual open house from 1 to 4 p.m. We hope to see everyone in the audience here, both online and in person at our annual open house. It's a chance for you to come not only just tour the building, but also meet all the fantastic faculty and staff that we have here at the Coastal Studies Institute and the great research that's being done here. Learn a little bit about our educational programs, things other than just our science on the sound. I also want to advertise our next science on the sound, which will happen um, in March, obviously, March 19th. Uh, faculty member April Blakesley, assistant professor in the Department of Biology at ECU, will be presenting on multi-host parasites, valuable conservation indicators in marine systems. Sounds fantastic and a wonderful topic right before dinner time, right? Um, but tonight we, uh, we have a real treat. We have uh, Marissa Liverman here. Melissa Liverman is the Citizen Science and Conservation Specialist for the Outer Banks Center for Wildlife Education. Marissa manages and supports a wide variety of citizen science programs in the Outer Banks as well as across the state of North Carolina. Her programs include sea turtles, marine mammals, frog calls, shorebirds, bats, and others. Welcome. Marissa. All right. okay. Well, thanks everyone that's here, um, that came to the presentation. Thank you for braving the weather. Um, and thanks to all that are watching online right now. Hi, mom and dad, they're watching, uh, from Michigan. So they were super excited. I'm going to be on TV. Um, so today we're going to talk about bats of North Carolina. And we're going to discuss some bat basics. So give you some bat biology background. Um, talk about white nose syndrome, why that's related to bats, um, and why it is an issue for bats. Uh, talk about how the commission, the Wildlife Commission, where I work for, monitors bats, and how you guys can help bats pretty easily just in your own backyard. So one of the first things when talking about bats that I want to do, and our, actually our bat biologist for the commission, I asked her, like, what's one of the big things I can do to people when I educate people about bats? And she said, really, honestly, dis dispelling these myths that surround bats is really, really important. And even if you're not a big fan of bats, or they're still kind of scary to you, um, just you know, correcting people and educating people, if they may say some of these things, just say, hey, no, actually, bats are this or bats are that is, is a great way to be a, a bat conservation steward. So the first one we hear a lot are bats are blind. So that can be reasonable in a sense because my, my little bat that I have a picture of up there that's saying, stop, dispel the myths. Um, you can't really see his eyes, um, and as if you know a little bit about bats, um, bats actually use, some bat species use echolocation, um, but they can actually see as well as humans do, bats who echolocate, um, but the reason they echolocate these bat species that do so is because they're hunting at night, so obviously eyesight is not going to be the best when they're hunting at night. Um, and so I found this really, I have a lot of cartoons for this slide. <laughs> so it says, blind family and colony of 2,000 to feed, please help. <laughs> so again, bats aren't blind. They actually can see as well as us, but the bats that we see in North Carolina actually use echolocation primarily to hunt. Next, all bats carry rabies. I'm her, sure you guys have heard of this. Um, it is a huge myth sur surrounding bats. Uh, all these bats can carry rabies. They're going to come down and bite you, and you're going to get rabies. Um, the truth is, in North Carolina, only about 3% of bats are tested, and when we're talking about what tested, these bats were actually sought out to actively be tested because they were acting weird, their behavior was weird, um, and so not really often do we have people calling and saying, there's a rabid bat, I need you to come, come check it out. Um, you're actually most likely to get bats or rabies from like your dog in certain cases, um, but obviously the big thing is do not handle bats, so if for some reason you did find a bat in your backyard that was injured, you obviously would wear gloves for protection um, and you know, make sure the bat doesn't bite you. And if it does, please seek a health physician in that case. Um, but um, rabies does scare people a lot um, from wanting to get, learn more about bats. Um, so hopefully I've taken some of your um, scaredness about the, the rabies uh, away. But really, honestly, um, bats are not actively looking to go out and bite you and give you rabies. Next, 
bats get tangled in your hair. So I feel like this was kind of Hollywood or movies that kind of portrayed this. You know, you have the lady who's walking and the bats are flying around her head and she's screaming and it's, it's so scary. Um, but really, I found this really cute cartoon. Um, this lady's walking with her flashlight and it says, relax, we're just trying to eat these bugs. The world doesn't revolve around you, you know. <laughs> so a lot of people tell me when they're out walking their dogs in the evening or sometimes early in the morning, they'll actually see bats flooding around. And usually that's because they're just, there's a food source nearby. There's insects. And I always tell people like, that is my dream. Like if I could see a bat <laughs> flying by my head, I would be like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Um, whereas other people really don't like that, which I totally understand. But really they're not trying to nest in your hair or anything like that. They're probably just eating a nice juicy moth or beetle. Next one, all bats suck blood. So we know like Dracula, bats, you'll suck your blood type thing. Um, so there actually are bat species that do. Technically people say they suck blood, but actually they don't. They actually bite the animal um, like livestock, like a cow, and then they actually lap it up with their tongue so they're not actively sucking it. Um, but those bats are called vampire bats and they're mainly in Central and South America. So again, whew, don't have to worry about them. Um, they're not in North Carolina or in the United States, uh, but um, we do have, what we'll talk about more is insect, insectivores or bats that mainly eat insects. So we'll discuss more about how that works. And then lastly, my last myth um, is bats are mice with wings because bats kind of look more like a rodent in a sense. It's got furry hair, they're kind of small. Um, but really, they're actually more closely related to primates. Um, and even one cool fun fact um, I used to do in another presentation, I would say, is a bat more closely related to a whale or a flying squirrel. And actually come, come to find out from me learning as well that um, bats are actually more closely related to whales as well because of the echolocation, because we have some whales and dolphins that echolocate as well, which I thought was really cool. So I have, again, another cute cartoon. That looks nothing like me. We have our little mice here with, with bat wings. <laughs> so dispelling the myths, again, is one big thing you guys can spread the word. So if anyone you know, says, oh, bat, bats carry rabies, or oh, they're, they're going to get in your hair, you guys now know, hey, no, actually, I learned this, that you know, they're doing this instead. Next one I want to talk about is mega versus micro bats. So bats are basically all over the world split up into these two categories. So megaoptera is the first group we're going to talk about, which usually consists of flying fox or fruit bats. These guys are found primarily in Africa, Asia, um, and Australia. Uh, they also, a lot of people think they look like little puppies in the face. Um, so if you've ever seen, you've probably seen on Facebook or on social media, um, people who rehab bats in other countries, those fruit bats, those bats that are like bundled up in those little blankets and they're eating bananas, um, those are in the mega family um, because they're eating, like I said, veg they're vegetarians, they're eating fruit, or they're eating pollen. So we typically don't see or we won't see this species of bats here in, in the United States or in North Carolina. But the cool thing about these mega bats is because they're called mega because they're usually pretty big. Um, this is an Indian flying fox bat and um, their wingspan is about five to six feet long. So they are pretty big bats. It might be a little scary seeing that come flying at you. Um, again, me, I would love it. <laughs> uh, but it's really cool how, how big these guys' um, wingspan can be. Um, and we'll talk about the difference in hunting. So these guys don't need um, bigger ears. Um, they have bigger eyes because they're most likely hunting. We're hunting with their sight and their smell. They don't need echolocation. So our micro bats, which is the main species of bats that we see here in North Carolina, these bats are typically smaller and they have more of a push in snout. They kind of look a little bit more, not scary, but just, you know, they kind of look weird because they have like really big ears and maybe a, a small face. They're usually found all over the world. Uh, they're typically carnivores and mostly feed primarily on insects. Um, and then there's, so one bat, I'm talking about the biggest bat, which was the flying fox species. So the smallest bat, which is actually found in Thailand and Myanmar, which I hope I'm saying that right, is the kitty's hognose bat. Um, it's also nicknamed the bumblebee bat because it is so tiny, like a bumblebee. Um, these guys, these guys' wingspan is very, very tiny. Um, it's like 
17 centimeters, which is a very, very small wingspan. Um, so they are the smallest species of bat. So you, uh, bats are very well wide versed in being very small and very big. So I do want to talk about bats um, and moms in particular uh, because they are really honestly super moms. Bats in general, first, they give birth upside down. So mom is hanging upside down, baby's coming, and she's got to have those reflexes to shoo, grab it and catch it before it falls to the ground. So already stressful pregnancy, like already giving birth, having to catch the young. Then the bats are born a third of their weight. So that's like us humans having a 40-pound baby. I know some of your moms are like, oh, my God. <laughs> Woo-wee. <laughs> already can deal with a, a six- to seven-pound baby is enough. Um, and then how do bats fly with their pups? So moms will have to fly sometimes with their pups, and pups are going to have to come along so they don't get lost. Well, bats actually have nipples located in their armpits, and um, the babies will latch onto the nipple, and I was like, ow, um, and then wrap around mom, and she takes off with the babies. But you think, okay, most bats have one pup, so they can manage, even though this is a lot going on. Well, there are some species, like the eastern red bat, which in this photo she actually has, you can see kind of two, but she technically has three pups on her. So third of a weight for one, that's, that's a lot of weight she's having to carry. Um, and also hoary bats is another species. They can have, these bat species can have twins or up until four pups kind of in, in one season. Uh, and the cool thing about bats too is they can de delay implantation. So um, they will mate with a male, maybe sometimes in the winter, and then they will store the sperm until spring until they know it's gonna be warm enough to give birth to their pups. But bats are truly, truly super moms. What's the gestational period? Um, I think upwards, they said it could, uh, so usually mammals and rodents, when you think of, or some mammals, it uh, usually can be like a short amount of time for their pregnancy, but I think bats can have up to like seven months of gestation, you know, before they're born. Uh, next is echolocation. Uh, we're going to talk about, because I briefly talked about our bats in North Carolina use echolocation to hunt primarily and to sometimes move around at night. And so basically it's like a game of Marco Polo. So if you, you know, in the pool, Marco, Polo, Marco, but um, hopefully the insects aren't saying Polo because uh, then they're, they're going to get eaten. Bats can actually echo, echolocate with an acoustic field of vision for two to ten meters. And so what I'm talking about is this picture shows really great is um, bats are emitting a sound and that sound wave is hopefully going to hit an object, which is hopefully going to be a juicy moth. And then it's going to bounce off that moth and come back to the bat and the bat can, from that sound wave, realize how far, how close it is to that, um, its meal so it can eat it. Um, and if you've ever seen a bat flying at night, you can see how they kind of fly sporadically, but um, that's why they're so well adapted to use this echolocation and be able to fly to catch these yummy insects, which we like, which we'll talk about, because we like that they eat insects. But what's really cool is nowadays with technology, we can actually see and hear bat calls. Um, technically, bat calls or their frequency is above what human ears can hear, um, but there are devices nowadays that you can actually use that will convert it to where you can actually hear a bat's call, and you can actually see the call on a spectrogram. Uh, I work with um, a bat researcher at UNCG um, Greensboro, Han Lee, um, and I do do an acoustic um, bat survey, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but he can actually look at this <laughs> spectrogram and know what species it is, which I'm totally impressed with that, and I'm hoping like one day I'll get to that level, and I told someone like, I'm gonna try one, one a year, learn one, one spectrogram call a year. Um, but I do want to show you guys really quick, I do have a recording I'm going to play um, of a bat call. And um, I, it's made through um, a device again so you guys can hear it. Okay. So um, it is very kind of loud clicks. And the reason why you could hear it actually clicking louder is most likely that bat was getting closer to its prey. So it's just clicking, click, clicking louder um, because it was getting closer and closer and closer. So it's trying to bounce that sound way off and see where exactly that prey is because it knew it was getting close. 
Um, so it is really cool to use technology nowadays to hear this because um, a lot of scientists, which we'll talk about, this is one key way they actually track bats. Oh, there we go. So why do we like bats? Why are bats important for our ecosystems? Why do we even want them around? Um, well, there's a lot of things bats do for us, um, and they're really at work getting a lot of daily things that we enjoy every day. Um, so they pollinate flowers. They disperse seeds, so fruit bats who eat fruit, obviously, if they eat the fruit, the seeds also in that, and then they poop that out, and the seeds will germinate and, and grow into to some yummy food, hopefully um, fruit. And then each year, bats actually save us billions of dollars on pest control by eating simply eating insects, and they eat a thousands and thousands of insects per night per bat. So we really like bats because they eat mosquitoes, and does anyone like mosquitoes? No, I don't. I mean, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, so I love, love bats because they, you know, they eat those pesky mosquitoes. And honestly, a lot for a lot of farmers, bats can be really uh, beneficial because they can take away a lot of those serious crop predators um, that are causing issues with crops. Because this is from Bat Conservation International, they have a lot of good information on their website and resources. But I thought this was really cool that it shows what bats protect. Things like coffee. We need coffee. Um, corn, I love corn on the cob. They propagate uh, cocoa and black pepper, um, and they pollinate agave and wild bananas. So those of us adults who like our tequila and our margaritas, we really want to think bats because they, they help with that agave that gets us our tequila. So getting into the bat species that we see here in North Carolina, we actually have 17 species of bats here in North Carolina. Um, and all of those are listed in pictures here. Um, I'm getting pretty good at bat identification, but don't ask me go to go row by row. I'm still learning. Uh, but a sad, a sad thing we do have to discuss is in red I have highlighted eight species of bats, and that's because eight of those species are affected by what's called white nose syndrome. Um, and we're going to talk more about what that is, um, but I do want to point out that is becoming an issue. So 17, or eight of our 17 bat species in North Carolina are being affected by this white nose syndrome. Now on the coast, to break that down a little bit more, we can see 13 of those 17 species here in North Carolina. So this is generally what you might see here on the coast. All, I say all the coast of North Carolina. But when I talk about the Outer Banks, it's really interesting because I don't really know, and our bat file just doesn't really know, what are our key species here in the Outer Banks. I know I'm pretty sure we probably have big brown bats, where are they at, which is pretty prominent um, in our area, and they're, they're pretty common throughout North Carolina. Um, but that's why I'm getting people interested in bats conservation and to be interested in bats, um, because we still, we don't know, really know what our population is here on the Outer Banks, and it would be really cool to to let our bat biologists know for the commission and for us just to generally know exactly what species are hanging out here on the Outer Banks. And my favorite bats are probably going to be Mexican freetail, look how cute they are, and then the raffinesque big ear bat. Um, because when I first saw that word, I was like, how do you say that? And now I can, now I can say it, raffinesque big eared bat. So there are some conservation issues surrounding bats. Um, habitat loss human conflict, wind energy, it is becoming a big issue, unfortunately. But the most um, important issue that is affecting bats is what's called white nose syndrome. So just to give you some background, I keep saying it, what is white nose syndrome? You guys are like, what is, what is that? White nose syndrome um, is a fungal disease. It's actually native to Europe or Asia. Um, the fungus, that's what the fungus is called. Don't ask me to say it. I will um, <laughs> slaughter it. Um, but I, it's called PD for short. It was actually discovered here in the United States in New York in 2006. Um, and so the really interesting thing is this disease is native to Europe and Asia. So bats in Europe and Asia have this, this fungal growing on them, but it doesn't affect them. It doesn't kill the bats like it's killing our bats here in the United States. So we're not sure why that is. Um, but it's affected 32 states and five provinces, and I probably need to update that because it has unfortunately slowly been spreading to the western part of the United States, um, which is not good too because we do have a lot of big populations of bats in our western part of the United States. And it came to North Carolina in 2011. 
It actually caused mass mortality of cave hibernating bats in North America, and it affects eight species like we talked about in North Carolina. So the reason why this is an issue and how this works is, as you guys can kind of see in my photos, this bat here, you can tell he's kind of got like this white fuzz on his um, muzzle here. So the fungus actually grows white on the bat's hairless parts of its body, so kind of its snout area, its ears, um, and even on its wings. And what happens is um, the bats end up with starvation, water loss, and physiological disruption. The fungus thrives in these cold environments, so bats have to hibernate in caves. We have cave hibernating bats, especially in the western part of North Carolina where we have caves. Um, and then the fungus thrives in this kind of cold environment. So it's growing on the bats, and then unfortunately it'll cause the bats to do unusual behavior like fly during the day. Um, and bats, you don't want to see a bat flying during the day because, especially during the winter time, because they should have beefed up their reserves, they should have gotten a little, little chunky for the winter, so they can hang out in these caves and stay in these caves for a while if needed. Um, but when this fungus grows on them, for some reason, they end up leaving, they end up losing their reserves, so they end up starving and eventually dying. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's being done to hopefully save bats, but in North Carolina, we've seen a 98% decrease in cave hibernating bats since, since it started, when it, I think in 2012 is when we really started to see the effects of white-nose syndrome. Um, I did go to um, a conference last week, the Southeastern Bat Diversity Network meeting, and it does look like our bat populations are kind of sort of stabilizing, but our populations are still low. So we're still trying to hopefully hope that um, these bat populations will begin to hopefully increase at some point. But there are studies and treatments being done, which we'll talk about, that will hopefully help bats. Just to give you an idea, um, if you're really interested in white-nose syndrome, there is a website for it. It's whitenosesyndrome.org. It does have a lot, a lot of information on it. Um, and they do have maps, and hopefully they, sh they should have an updated map, but I have this one up to 2018 here. But as you can see, in North Carolina, um, 2011, and it's kind of spread up and out west, um, and I think it's even you know, spread out this way as well. Um, so it is very unfortunate. And the reason why this is happening and why they think it started is there's people who are interested in caves and going into caves and um, um, I don't know. I, don't, I can't see myself squeezing through caves. I can't do it. <laughs> Unless it's a really big cave and I can walk through. Um, but um, what you, when you talk to bat biologists nowadays, we're really cautious about when we're working with bats, especially in caves. They're in the whole Tyvek suits. They're fully covered because um, you can spread this fungus, they found out, just by going from cave to cave. So they think cave hikers and such were going in with their gear, having a good time, and then, oh, let's go to this other cave here, you know, in the next date. And then they go into that cave, and then the fungus is able to kind of, the spores are able to be left in there, and then um, waiting for bats to, to grow on it. So again, um, just to give you a list of who is actually bat species who is susceptible to white-nose syndrome, we have the Indiana bat, our northern long-eared bat, little brown, tricolored, gray, eastern small-footed, southeastern. Um, big brown bat has not been tested positive yet or fallen ill with uh, white-nose syndrome just yet. They have seen the PD, the fungus, swabbed on them, so they will swab bats when they um, catch them, which we'll talk about mist netting. Um, but it technically has not seen a huge decrease as far as we know just yet from from the fungus, but they are susceptible to this white-nose syndrome, unfortunately. And most of these species already, you can see, are endangered or threatened or a species of concern. So how do we monitor things like this, though, and how, how do we continue to see are bats going to be okay? Do we need to, to continue to take drastic measures to save bats, or, or what do we need to do to uh, continue to help them? There's about five different methods that the commission does to monitor bats. Um, there's high binocular surveys, mist netting, roost surveys. Um, there's the NA bat acoustic monitoring program. And then this year new, we started a culvert surveys, uh, which is really interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll show you how that worked. But the first are the high binocular surveys. So this is going into the caves in the western part of the state of North Carolina. This is our bat biologist, Catherine Etchison. She is the best bat biologist I've ever met. 
Jane out. She's going to be like, don't stop it. Um, she's so nice. She'll answer any of your questions. I bombard her with emails all the time, and she somehow still gets back to me. I, I don't know how she does it with all that she has to do in the field. Um, but she, she goes in these caves, and she counts, looks at bats. Uh, and what they're looking for is population trends. So they're looking for presence, increase and decreases in population trends. So this is how they were able to find out that we had a huge decrease in bats due to white nose syndrome. And that's something they're constantly monitoring. And the way that we do it is um, they swab bats with like a cotton tube or tip. Um, sometimes if they're able to, they won't do it in the caves, um, but they will look at their wings as well because white nose syndrome can, can show up in, in the wing membranes. Um, but they take those swabs back and they go for testing to see if they're positive for the PD, the fungus. Mist netting. Um, this is really fun. And I was fortunate enough, that's me, to, um, to go out mist netting uh, a couple times in this past year um, out in uh, Columbia area. We did a, um, a coastal uh, bat blitz, which was pretty awesome. And usually Catherine surveys about around 30 sites across the state. And again, we're looking at population trends. So what happens is it's, this thing is like a huge like setup. And I don't know, one time I went with like two, two or three ladies doing this. And I was like, you women are the bomb. Because like they were setting up these huge tall nets and stringing them up like it was nothing. And they got all prepared, like four or five of these huge, huge nets. Um, but the cool thing, too, is it's not just sitting and waiting. Um, you have to, you are sitting, what I'm doing here, because I'm waiting to, I'm a subscriber, so that's a very important job. Um, but they would come to the table when they found a bat in the net. But the funny thing is, they were like, okay, well, we have to go back and check the net every six minutes. And I'm like, oh, wow, why do you why have to check it every six minutes? Um, because the bats will chew their way out of the net. <laughs> so they don't want to lose the bat because they want to collect data on it, but then also, too, they want to make sure they get the bats out in a reasonable time as well and keep checking the net so the bats aren't stuck in there too long. Um, and they've actually sometimes ca caught owls, too, in, in that instance. Um, they are sa able to safely get them out, um, but it is also a cool, cool chance to see an owl, and the owl's not very happy, but they definitely let it go. Um, but mist netting is another way for bat people to, or bat biologists to get their eyes on bats and kind of get samples and see how that population is doing. Next is roost surveys. So again, we're counting bats in known roost, looking at population trends. And this is something that I'm trying to get a handle on more here in our area too. So if you do have a bat house and it is successful, please let me know. Or even if you're only seeing a couple bats come in and out of it, because eventually I would like to do a citizen science roost monitoring program. Um, and we do have some roosts that are known in the western part of the state. And basically, that's just waiting and then counting the bats as they fly out, um, which I think is, is going to be a lot of fun. And we also have bats that hang out. This is probably a bridge um, and bridges as well. So they're notorious for doing that. So there are some locations here in North Carolina where we're checking bridges as well for bat populations. Next is our NA Bat Acoustic Monitoring Program. This actually just started statewide this past summer, was our first summer going statewide. It, our goal was to engage citizen science, uh, citizen scientists to get in, involved in, in collecting bat research or bat data. We're looking at population trends. Um, I do want to just show you really quick. So this is what we're using. If anyone's ever heard of, it's called an Ecometer Touch. Um, it's an awesome device um, that basically records bat calls. That little device is what's recording bat calls. So we actually, I'll show you a picture next. We hook it up on top of a car, and that connects to this iPad here. And through the Ecometer's app, you can actually see the bat call. It'll actually give you a possible ID of what the bat is. And you can also hear it. Um, so it was a lot of fun for our uh, volunteers this year. As you can see, they have a little suction cup with the Ecometer on it, and then that's attached down to the car. And they drove 20 miles per hour down a route. And um, only one volunteer got pulled over. <laughs> I was like, no one's going to get pulled over. And then, of course, someone got pulled over. But it was just like, hey, are you OK? What are you doing? Uh, because uh, we do have them have signs on the back that say, um, you know, slow vehicle wildlife survey in progress. So people knew, like, this is why we're going slow. We're just, you know, collecting bat calls. Um, so this program's been a lot of fun. Uh, we're excited for our next season. 
Um, and I'm really, really hoping that I can get us a route here in the Outer Banks one day. Um, but it requires a lot of thinking because you have to go 20 miles per hour. The survey is during June and July, so <laughs> during the busy season, that would be, yep. And we don't want a lot of stop signs and things like that, but I told um, the researcher I work with, I said, we're going to make it work one day. We're going to find a way um, because I would love to get people involved in doing this here as well. Oh, and I do want to mention, um, we had some folks at the, the NC Zoo, um, Wendy and Leslie, they actually were very excited to be bat acoustic volunteers, and they decked out their uh, cart as a Batmobile, and they dressed up as bats, and I just absolutely love that they went so gung-ho on this. Um, so it really made me happy to, to see them get this, this excited, so um, I'm hoping all our volunteers will, will gear up their cars like this this season. So this year was our first coastal culvert bat survey blitz. And if you're like, what's a culvert? Because that's what I was like, I don't know what a culvert is. Um, it's actually um, underneath the roadways, um, kind of where water's hanging out underneath, uh, obviously for flooding as well. Um, but this was my dream team right here. Um, this is Austin Paul from Jockey's Ridge calling you out. And this is my um, intern, Yvonne. So we were crazy enough, and we went into those culverts because we wanted to see if there were bats in there. So there's some other states like Georgia and Louisiana who have decided to check out culverts because they say, hey, are bats hanging out in there? It's kind of like a bridge, it's dark, it's kind of moist. Um, and they've had success with finding bats in culverts. So we were like, hey, I wonder if culverts are hanging out, or bats are hanging out in culverts in North Carolina. So my team unfortunately did not see any bats. Um, I saw a lot of really big spiders, um, <laughs> like really big spiders. Um, and then, we, uh, of course, someone had to mention, I wonder if there's alligators down here. And I'm like, oh, because you know, sometimes we were in waist deep water and I was kicking, like, oh, please, I'm, I'm coming. Whatever's in, in the water, please don't let me step on you. Um, but our bat biologist, Catherine, did find bats in culverts. So here's um, a picture, kind of a crack in a culvert of a bat that's a tricolored bat. Can't see here. Here's another picture of a culvert where a bat was found right here. This is also a tri-colored bat. And this is a, just a close-up. And these guys are actually called tri-colored bat because this is a good photo showing it because there are three colors. <laughs> so the brown, the kind of blackish on the wings, and then kind of the pinkish reddish color on the wings as well. And they found this little guy. This is actually, uh, like I said, one of my favorite bats. It's a raffinesse bat. So he was just hanging off the wall. They also did find bats in what's called weeping holes in these culverts. So it was just kind of like a little hole, and we thought it was pretty interesting because it's usually, you know, bats would be more hanging off a wall or something like that, but they were actually pretty interested in these weeping holes. Um, so there was a study I had read recently that maybe the weeping holes might be a little bit warmer than the actual hanging from the wall in the culvert, so maybe that's why he was in there, and that's a tricolored bat. And then <laughs> there's more of my dream team. I, I sent this picture to some people and they were like, what, why? Why did you do that? I said, well, it was fun. It was kind of, you know, scariness and excitement. Um, and I, I'd definitely do it again next year because it was a lot of fun even though we didn't see bats. So a little bit of hope to share with you guys because I know we got a little doom and gloom with white nose syndrome. Uh, but there's hopefully some hope to our bats recovering in North Carolina. So some of our bats here in North Carolina actually have a statewide distribution, even though they have white nose syndrome. Uh, Tricolored northern long-eared bats, big brown and little brown bats. And so what that means is basically what we're talking about is white nose syndrome requires that constant cold, cold temperature. So could we have survivors on the coastal plains? So we're already hopefully seeing, um, there was a, a study done recently and, um, by Youth Fish and Wildlife, and I wish I could remember um, the man's name, but he actually did a research project recently here in the northeast part of North Carolina in the coastal plains and found a whole population, a small population of northern long-eared bats. And their actually populations have been unknown for a while and have been depleting. Um, but through his study, he actually found out that um, we actually have an abundance or we have some northern long-eared bats here on the northeast part of the, um, the coast. And then we have some in the mountains, but there's really not a population in the Piedmont. So it's like this weird distribution of two different kind of populations separated between the, the Piedmont. But since we don't get very cold winters, which we might be getting snow 
Oh God, I, I hope he gets snow. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm originally from Michigan, so um, I don't mind just a little bit of snow. It reminds me of home. Uh, but since it is usually typically warmer, our bats here don't have to hibernate. Usually they're finding trees and such to, to hang out in. Um, so we have not detected white nose syndrome on the coast and we hopefully won't because the fungus won't be able to grow. Other resources that people are using for white nose syndrome are treatments are going under effect in field trials. Um, none in North Carolina right now at the moment. We're kind of letting everyone else do it and then maybe we'll be like, okay, that'll work. Um, so some of these treatments include um, shellfish compounds, fungal, uh, which is biotol organic compounds, and then the same thing with bacterial. So they're looking into these different options, um, but the hard part is too is especially in caves, which I didn't know, caves kind of have their own ecosystem, their own micro, uh, microsystem and microbes and things like that. So it's really hard to treat entire caves that could affect the cave itself and the bats. So there's a lot of factors going into it. Um, but there's a lot of people interested in the white nose syndrome and I think eventually we're gonna get somebody that's gonna hopefully figure it out. So getting to ways you guys can help bats. Be a bat ambassador, like I said, easily just dispel myths. So even if you're like, I really don't want to get into much more of bats, I appreciate them from a distance. Um, but the, <laughs> the best thing you can do is, like I said, dispel those myths like we talked about. Educate your friends on the benefits of bats. So talk about like, hey, that margarita you're sipping, sipping right now, it's all thanks to bats. And she, <laughs> can you tell, I think I need a margarita after this talk. Um, pest control, we talked about, save billions. Um, by not having to use pesticides for our corn industry. They're pollinators. Again, pollinators for the agave plant, agave, sugar, and tequila. They're also used for medicine. So vampire bats, even though they're a little scary, they, they use blood, that's their main source of food. Um, their saliva is actually used for stroke victims. And so not only educating people about bats, you can also get really involved if you want by even building a bat box to install in your own backyard. Um, and so I really want and to and encourage people to do this, especially here in the Outer Banks, because like I said, if we can get a roost monitoring program going in the Outer Banks, that would be wonderful. And we can have colonies to count. You could sit in your backyard and watch the bats fly out and count them for me. Seems like a really difficult job. Um, <laughs> but if you're a little scared, like I don't, I have people, I don't really want bats, you know, posted up in my backyard, you know, having a house and everything. You can plant a back garden. So those of you who already plant plants, you can plant some plants that in case are helping as a food source. So you're attracting moss and beetles and such things. So bats can at least maybe stop by for dinner, a late night dinner through your backyard and you don't have to worry about them living there necessarily. Even though they may be living in a tree or so um, in your backyard. And then, like I said, you can volunteer as a citizen scientist. So if you do get involved with a bat house and it is successful, I would love to have you monitor it because um, I can only get somewhere, so many places at once. And then, like I said, hopefully one day we will have an acoustic monitoring project to hopefully drive here in the Outer Banks or nearby. So I do want to discuss bat houses just briefly because I get a lot of people who ask me about bat houses and um, different things. Bat houses. They seem pretty easy. Oh, I just get one, I put it up. Um, bats are actually really picky. <laughs> so um, even if you just throw it up there, there's a lot of thinking that goes into how to place a bat house properly in order for it to be successful. Uh, so if you're interested, I do have some handouts for those here if you would like to look at those about bat houses. But really, Bat Conservation International, we refer to them always. They are the kind of leaders in bat conservation. They do a lot of studies with bat houses. And they also have a list of resources for bat houses, which includes links to buy um, or even build. Um, and when you're buying or building bat houses, we really always say to do a multi-chamber or rocket box um, building plan. So multi-chambered means just two chambers and up, um, preferably would be three or four chambered, because uh, typically single chambered, those little bat houses you maybe see sold at like a general store typically don't do well and we want a lot of bats to roost in a bat house because hopefully one day we'll get a roost colony like a maternity colony because uh, in the summertime the females will nest in, in a colony together in the in summer taking care of the babies 
And then there's also such things as bachelor pads, because while the females are raising the young, all the men are kind of like, oh, just waiting for the, the women to raise the young. So when I'm talking about bat houses, though, there's a couple things to keep in mind. You want to keep it 12 to 20 feet high, at least. And the reason we ask that or do that um, is because when a bat exits a bat house, it's got to have enough air to kind of get some air underneath its wings to fly. So if your bat house was just on this wall and the bat tried to drop out, it's most likely going to hit the floor because it doesn't have enough air to kind of give it a flight. You want to avoid mounting on trees. I know for a while that was a thing, no, just put it on the tree because bats roost on trees. So it'll, it'll use the bat house. Uh, but that's really not as successful because predators can climb up those trees easily. We have rat snakes here, even a, a squirrel or a raccoon or something that could get up in it and disturb it. Um, as well as sometimes those bat houses don't get as enough temperature as they need. Because normally a bat house, bats want to live in a warm environment because they're, they're warm blooded like us, they want to be warm especially those maternity colonies, um, usually those need to be upwards to close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So they want to be hot. So that requires six to eight hours of sun, especially in the morning. So you want to make sure your bat house is getting that much sunlight if possible. Near water source if possible is great too because they're going to need a source to get something to drink and stay hydrated. Um, you can paint the outside a medium or dark shade. Usually I would say like a a dark gray or even a green here for our region, and that will help hopefully with the temperature to keep it hotter in the summertime or even in the sunlight when the, in the winter when it's colder. Oh, no, one more thing. And then um, lastly, too, as you can see, you can post it on a wooden post like this, a metal pole, um, or even if, you're, if you don't mind, uh, up on the roof eaves of your house as well. Um, and I do have a bat house that I know of at the moment that is up on someone's garage under the roof eaves, and it does have bats in it, so they seem to like it. Uh, but overall, I thank you guys so much for listening, and now we can take questions. Yeah. I think they're going to come around with a microphone real quick for those who have questions. Hi, Marissa. Hi. Um, at Sandy Run Park, I've recently seen new bat boxes installed. In the, do you know anything about those? I do. Okay. <laughs> um, I just found out about them. Um, I'm hopefully going to be in contact with someone to see about those because it, it was a great idea and a great initiative, and I really think that's a great location to have bat houses. I think we just need to talk about placement a little bit more because, um, yeah, I wasn't notified. <laughs> I do, <laughs> but I found out later um, after they had already done it, so. You had identified the um, wind turbines as being a hazard. Is there any directions as to how high you put it? Is, do bats only go so high? Yes, yeah, so what the question, can be done about that? The question was, um, you know, looking into wind turbines, how that's affecting bats. Is, is the height of the wind turbine affecting? Will that affect bats? If we maybe, I think you're, what you're saying is maybe if it's higher or lower, will that help it? Um, so the issue with that is, as far as I know, I know we have that wind farm near Elizabeth City um, area, and our bat biologist for the commission is trying to get more information on that because I think she does get reports every year if there are dead bats found on the property. And I think when I recently talked to her, she said it was kind of a higher number than she thought. Um, so unfortunately, I think that's something we're still a little behind on as far as trying to figure out how exactly that's affecting bats. Unfortunately, those also affect birds because they're flying through. Um, but I have heard in some instances for birds and possibly bats they're looking into like um, a deterrent as far as like a sound maybe, hopefully, like an emitting sound that might say like, don't come this way or I'm scaring you away so they hopefully won't even fly through that area. Um, but hopefully there can be more that can be done so um, we can kind of have a compromise with that as well. So um, we can have the, the wind energy, but then also the bats aren't being affected. You talked about the acoustic monitoring and driving around. What about uh, stationary ones? Because when at dusk when I sit on my front porch, I will see the bats flying around sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question. So she said I talked about um, kind of acoustic monitoring through driving a route, but what about stationary stations? 
So there are um, researchers, the researcher I work with actually, he does set up stationary acoustic settings. We actually had one set up at um, the center I work at, the Outer Bank Center for Wildlife Education. Um, those setups are a little bit more expensive in a sense, um, but if you were really interested in bats and you kind of wanted to hear the acoustics going on in your backyard, especially if you see them, you could purchase one of those ecometer touches that I um, talked about. It's sold by Wildlife Acoustics, so you can go online to their website. That version is ecometer touch two, um, and it's only about 170 something dollars or so. Um, and then you just need, you can use your iPhone or it's um, also Android compatible. They have an Android system as well, or so like an I iPad or an Android tablet. Um, you can use too, so you just plug that into the bottom where you would charge for iPads where you charge it, um, or your phone and you kind of just hold it up or you could put it up on something and kind of just see what, what you're catching. Um, so if you, anyone's interested in doing that, um, definitely let me know because I'd be happy to show you how that works and helps. But I'm hoping too, eventually we will get some stationary units set up around the Outer Banks as well because that seems a great way to presence and absence to see what bats we're getting because we can hear them coming by, but it is really hard, like I said, even just to catch bats just mist netting or going out and looking for them. Uh, could you go back to the uh, website link that you had? I was trying to get a picture of it. Yes, he's asking me to go back to this one. That's Yes, so um, if you just go to batcon.org, Bat Conservation International, they do have a resource tab and getting involved, and then you go to bat houses if you're interested in information about houses. And it, also, if you want to, did you get the, okay. My email, I'll leave that up again, is at the bottom at the end of the screen, so please feel free to send me an email if you have more questions about bat houses as well. If you don't see any bats, and you go put a bat house up, how do you attract them? It's a good question. So if you don't see any bats in your yard, but you decide to put a bat house up, how do you attract bats? Well, hopefully the way you put your bat house up is hopefully going to attract bats eventually. But unfortunately, it can take up to three years for bats to roost in a bat house. Um, there's people who actually sell like bat attractant, or there's things online where they say, oh, if you put bat, bat guano around the house, the bats will come. Um, but unfortunately, and you can read on Bat Conservation International's website, that really, as far as they can see what they've tested, it really does not make the bats more attracted to your bat house. So unfortunately, it's kind of a waiting game, but hopefully if you use the requirements that I say, you know, keeping it at the right height, towards the sunlight, um, putting it on that post or pole and not on a tree, um, you will hopefully have a successful bat house. But it is unfortunately up to the bats. I wish we could be like, come on, just, have a big yellow sign like, come on, I got a new house for you. But um, unfortunately, it is up to them if they want to come in or not. Do they have certain flyways or do they just fly randomly? Um, I don't know that they have necessarily certain flyways like birds do. Um, but I do know some species like um, our Hawaii bats do migrate. So they will migrate up north um, of, of our state and back and forth. Um, but I don't necessarily think, as far as I know, they have certain flyaways. I've got a strange bat house. I counted 44 come out of it one night. <gasps> really? Yes. Oh, I, I need to talk to you after this. <laughs> they, they come out three at a time. Really? And it's the plastic chase that goes up a light pole Uh huh. that the wires go up. Yeah and they evidently live inside there. It's like a light pole. Is it very, is it very thin? It's just it's a cover for you. It's called a chase. It's just plastic. It's yeah. A four, it's a half round, and they come out three at a time. And I guess they have to walk up and come out three at a time. But we counted 44 come out. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, bats love tight, you know, tight places. Um, and I have a bat house up here you guys can look at. You know, they don't have to have a big space where they squeeze in. But that actually sounds more like um, those rocket boxes. I didn't have a picture of it, but there's a bat house design called a rocket box. And it's slender, and it's kind of more square, but it has all these different slots in it. And that bat house plan is actually what they've shown more successful most of the time than these other, um, these other bat houses. But they're sometimes they're more expensive to buy, and I think they're a little bit harder to build. But that, the way you explain that, I think they like that because it's like that cylindrical, and it's very tight for them to get into. 
But that's really interesting that they're using, it's kind of like a, a weird roost for them to do use. Do they migrate or do they stay in the same area 12 months out of the year? Well, that's the interesting thing is we don't really know in the Outer Banks. And that's something I'm hoping to help gather research on for our bat biologists because she said she would love to know our bats here in the Outer Banks staying in these artificial roosts all year long because, you know, we're not getting as cold. So will they stay in an artificial roost like that um, all winter long, all through the summer, or is it just during the winter and they're going to their natural roosts like a tree during the summer? Um, so I would love to hear what that is so we, we can maybe use that as a, a, a base point to see what, sure. what our bats are doing. So. Yeah, so the issue is, yeah, is the bat house going to get too hot? And I'm looking back to see if I have a better photo of a bat house. Actually, I'll just show you on, um, let me go back to my, this bat house. So bat houses normally, they should always have what's called a, a ventilation slit. So in this bat house, there's this line here. So in that case, if a bat house does get way too hot in the summertime, usually the bats are going to be hanging out more up towards the roof of a bat house. Um, they will actually, so they don't have to leave the bat house because hopefully if moms are raising young and it's during the day and they're getting way too hot, this is what this ventilation is for, for them to scoot down in the bat house and hopefully that's giving them enough breeze or airway to kind of get a little window breeze um, to not be as hot. So that's why that is built into most bat houses to hopefully help with that. It's called Wildlife Acoustics. Yeah, um, there's been a, uh, a worldwide collapse in insect population observed. I wonder if there's been any correlation with bat population or effect on the bat population because of the insect collapse? That's a great question. Um, he was saying that there's a big um, de decrease in insect populations. Does that have anything to do with bats as well? That's something a lot of people who study bats are intrigued in someone doing. Um, like I said, this bat conference I was just at, the researcher I was, I was there with, he said it would be really interesting for someone to study bats' food source insects um, because what, you know, what exactly is going on with that? Are bats surviving more because, you know, are there insects abundance in certain areas where they're able to survive more? Uh, or is that contributing to the white nose syndromes depleting and then they're not having enough food source? So, um, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that, but it would be a great maybe master's project <laughs> for someone, someone to look at. So, I have a question from your father. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know how long do bats live, and how long do they stay in the same area? Uh, so, how long do bats live? Bats are actually pretty amazing because they can live upwards to about 30 years, which is is very. Um, unusual for like a small mammal. Um, and I forgot to mention, they're also the only flying mammal, which is really interesting. Um, and do they typically stay in the same area as what you're saying? How long? How long? Um, really, that depends on the species, I would say, how long they stay in an area. Like I said, we do have some species of bats, like the hoary bats and um, the silver-haired bats that do migrate in and out of our state, or they migrate from the western part to the, the coastal part of our state. Um, so it depends on if a bat migrates or not, but typically bats, like our big brown bats, if there's a population here, they're going to be here year-round. Have they studied bats long enough to see if their uh, lifespan is, is uh, cyclical? Like you'll have, you know, a big population for three or four years and then a down population for three or four years and... Yeah, there, so there is... Um, that there's a lot of people who have been studying bats for a while, and so we know when white nose syndrome came, that's why we could see, oh, there's a big decrease in our bat populations. Um, but there are some studies that, that do see that some populations, you know, have which is normal for a decrease and an increase in kind of a stabilization of up and down, up and down flux fluctuations. So that's pretty normal for any, hopefully, wild animal population, because you might have animals that aren't doing good, foraging good this year, maybe a die off. Maybe there was some disease going around. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, we had that huge drop off because of white nose syndrome. And hopefully, they're hoping bat populations are starting to stabilize. 
but we still have issues with certain species like um, you know, tricolors and northern long eared bass that we still are unsure of what their population um, levels are at the moment. Um, we just know kind of about subsets. <laughs> you mentioned rabies uh, briefly. I take it from your remarks that uh, bats, generally speaking, are not a major reservoir of rabies. Is that correct? Well, so like any mammal, they can, they are major vectors of rabies, so they can um, easily carry rabies, uh, but... Well, I know they can. I'm yeah. just asking, is it, is it uh, the major reservoir, or is it more raccoons, like in Ohio? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I would, I would say bats are probably more prominently the, the reservoirs of rabies here, um, oh. but... but here and mostly across the United States, but um, raccoons and foxes, you know, aren't too far behind. It's just the, the issue of most likely, and, and there's not a lot of cases where... And reported state, exposures are very low, I yes, take it. Yes, exposures are very yeah. low. Okay. Yep. <laughs> there's a slight lull, so I'll jump right in. Okay. Um, I've heard the term citizen scientist used mm -hmm. mostly, well, fairly recently. And so what part do citizen scientists have in, in bat studies, and how do you become one? Yes. And is it necessary to be one? Yes. To, yeah. So the question was, um, you know, citizen science is something that she's heard of. Um, how is that helpful for studying bats, and how, is it, how are you able to become kind of a part of it? Um, well, the reason why citizen science is important and why we mention that, and that's the work that I mainly do, is a lot of the stuff that I monitor here in the state would not be possible without citizens. Um, so just to mention, like our sea turtle group, nests that I work with, um, we, it's myself and my supervisor that kind of manage it for the commission, um, and we get plenty of nests each year, so if without them, I would have to be on an ATV in the summertime every morning checking out, you know, early in the morning every single day, which, whew, that would be a lot. Um, but for bats, as far as citizens, like I said, our bat biologist is stationed primarily in the western part of the state, and most of her work is done in the western part of the state. Um, so when I got interested in bats, she was very excited because I could be an advocate but also educate, um, as well as get citizens in, interested in helping monitor our bats. Because like I said, she can only come out this way every so often or a couple times a year or when she can plan for it. Um, but if we can get citizens like us interested enough and involved, maybe we can all come together and, like I said, start these roost monitoring projects and then get people acoustically who want to um, study our bats uh, because it's really important because I, I really can't say, you know, we have this exact species, I know there's this species here because uh, we just don't know. And you guys are, are around, um, you know, you guys are able sometimes to volunteer, which is great. So citizens can get around a lot easier than biologists can, unfortunately, because they have other, other things they're supposed to do as well. So you would be a point of contact for that? Yes, yep. So if anyone's interested in anything citizen science-wise for biology or bats in our area and anything else that I sort of mentioned or interested in citizen science-wise, um, please let me know because I'm involved in an array of things and I would love to get you out in the field um, to have some fun. Well, if there are any more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Thank you very much for being here, Marissa. Thank you guys and for having thank me. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you.